Whenever you want, I can start. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. You are most welcome in our third webinar for this year. Hope everybody is uh, staying at home, staying safe all over the world. Uh, welcome of our uh, kids and participants from outside Palestine. I think we have at least 15 person from outside Palestine. Are so welcome. And uh, in your names, I'm uh, I welcome Tunisi uh, Balut, Professor Balut, our friend and a friend of our Palestinian people, from Mexico, from Beirut, from Lebanon. Uh, He's going to speak about uh, surgery first options and orthodontics. So um, you are most welcome, Dr. Nasib, and thank you very much for joining us in this lecture. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Okay. Th thank you very much. This is a great pleasure being with you, with all my Palestine friends. And also I welcome all the people which is not from Palestine that is uh, connected to this uh, webinar. So as Ahmed says, I hope everybody is safe. Uh, in Mexico, we are just uh, starting that the curve is starting going up. So let's see how it's going to end up in, in, in Mexico City because of the population. But uh, inshallah, everything stays uh, like every, every place, the less amount we wish uh, the less amount of people get uh, sick. So let's let's start. Today I wanted to speak about surgery first uh, approach. Thank you for the invitation to my very good friend Dr. Saad and all my uh, friends from the Palestinian Orthodontic Society. So. Uh, when we wanted to treat a surgical case, now we have like three options to do this combined treatment, ortho and surgery. The, we can do it the conventional orthognatic surgery. We can do the early surgery and then the surgery first approach. Let's talk very little about the conventional orthognatic surgery. I think everybody was taught to treat these cases like this, that we have to do a pre-surgical dental alignment, then to do a decompensation of the anterior teeth, have a very good arch coordination, then do the orthognatic uh, surgery. And after that, uh, the ortho, ortho finishing with the orthodontic treatment. So with this, it should con to have a considerable increase of in treatment times. I'm gonna show you a case. This case was treated uh, by me. <clears throat> Uh, when he had about nine years old, her mother had an ortho orthognatic treatment. She had a mandibular setback and her mother was concerned about his boy. Uh, she didn't want him to pass through the surgery, but the patients had very bad cooperation. I remember that we placed him on, on a face back. He has that tendency of, uh, of growth. So he almost spent, here is him at about 19 years uh, of age. When we were planning him <clears throat> to have the, the, the surgery. So it took us a long time. He never used a face mask. We prepare him for the decompensation, and it was a really long ortho surgery combined treatment. There are some cases 
that uh, we don't feel that confident in order to do the surgery first approach. So we can do the early surgery. I'm gonna show you one, one case, probably one of my worst class three cases that I ever had. She came to my office recommended by the surgeon because she heard something about the surgery first. And she didn't want to spend that long with braces. She never had an ortho treatment in the past. She has a very, she had a very severe class three with an open bite. It was almost like a reverse curve on the lower arch. So when I was planning the case with the surgeon, at that time I, did, I was not feeling that confident to proceed with this case and go for a surgery first approach. So we decide to level and align mainly the lower arch and then do the surgery. That's why we call it early surgery. So that's what we did. I'm gonna go back yeah, a little. Now, if I have this case now, for sure, I will start it with the, with the surgery first approach right away. At that time, I was in my learning curve. So that's why I was not feeling that confident to treat this type of, of a case. So we can see the class three relation that the patient had, a severe class three. So we did the, the predictions and we were planning to do a mandibular setback and maxillary advancement and also a genioplasty. That at the end, the patient didn't want the genioplasty. I will show you the case. So this is the amount of negative overjet that the patient had. As I said at the beginning, she never had an ortho treatment in the past. And after probably between six, seven months of uh, preparing her with brackets, our main objective main was object. to level and align the lower arch, upper and lower arch, mainly the, the reverse curve that she had in the lower arch. So this is her, more or less six, seven months when we were ready for the surgery. As long as we have a better occlusal plane, then we felt more comfortable to do the, the procedure. So we place the surgical wires and we were ready to do the, the surgery. As you can see, we, it took about six months to level mainly the lower arch to prepare her for the surgery. This is her left side. We then did the surgery in models to find out the amount of the maxillary and uh, the advance of the maxilla and the mandibular setback. This is her after the two jaw surgery. As you can see now with the fix, uh, rigid fixation, upper and lower arches. And this is her at the nine months of uh, treatment where we were almost getting ready to finish her. She, on the predictions, she didn't want to have the genioplasty, but I think she will be looking better if we move a little back that uh, chin. Anyhow, this is the way we treated her with the early surgery. As you can see, the initials right before the surgery with the surgical wires, and this is after the surgery. 
This is when we debunked her. It took us about uh, nine months, 11 months, I'm sorry, to finish her up. So as I said, if we didn't want to do the surgery first approach in this case, because we didn't feel that comfortable with this type of uh, bite that she had it. And I was in my learning curve. This is her before and after. So anytime I feel that I don't, I don't feel that comfortable or the surgeon don't, doesn't feel that comfortable in doing the surgery first approach, now we do early surgery. It's very rare that we do the ortho surgery, the, the orthognatic surgery, the conventional treatment anymore. So let's go to the topic. The surgery first concept was developed mainly to reduce treatment time. Plus we have the advantage of the wrap, which is known since Cole published the, the interdental corticotomy in the crowded lower front to accelerate orthotic alignment in the 50s. So, as I said, one of the main objectives of the surgery first approach is just treatment time. And I think it's ideal for class three cases. In a class two with a mandibular retrusion, in a very short mandible, that's the only case that I will wait and don't do surgery first on those cases because right after the surgery, we have to leave them in a anterior cross bite. And a lot of these cases, they have a severe uh, curve of speed. And on the back, we, we won't have any occlusal contacts right after the surgery. So uh, me and the surgeon, surgeons, we don't feel that comfortable in doing this type of approach, just in those cases. But I will say that in my practice, probably uh, of my surgical cases, more than 80% of them, we do it with the surgery first approach. So now we have a lot of uh, literature that uh, they talk about this procedure and probably one of the main uh, doctor that has been talking about this is Dr. Suhawara. And he has a different uh, approach to decompensate the, the patients. I'm gonna talk later on. So at the end, I will leave you my email. So anyone that is interested in uh, the literature, I can, I, can, I can send you some and I will be more than happy. So this is the Suhawara protocol for surgery first. In a class three patients, he, he makes the patient a severe class two and that's why he develops uh, his plates to use some intermaxillary elastics and then finish the case. Our approach that I'm gonna, our, our, our protocol that I will show you later is we don't want to decompensate uh, as much the patients. I, I don't think we need to decompensate that much uh, our surgical patients. We don't find the reasons why we have to do that big decompensation. So again, one of the main objectives of the surgery first approach is to reduce treatment time. There are some advantage for the surgery first approach that we will have immediate results. We will have the change in the facial appearance the self-esteem and psychological environment of the patient 
will change right away. We will need the pre-surgical orthodontic phase. And I think this is very important that we will have a new functional, dynamic and balancing soft tissue right after the surgery. Plus that we reduce the treatment time and also we have uh, the wrap. Of course, we will have some disadvantage too and we have to consider them. The orthodontist and the surgeon must be experienced and needs to plan very good treatment in, in, in advance. So that, it's, that it will be more close cooperation between the surgeon and the orthodontist. It seems like all surgeons, uh, every time I, when I start doing the, the, this type of uh, approach, the surgery first approach, and talk with some old surgeons to start doing it, they, they didn't want to, they, they did, didn't feel com comfortable about this procedure because all of them are thinking more in the Suhawara protocol. And they think that if you don't have that tripodism right after the surgery, it will be difficult for stability on the cases. Uh, the orthodontry treatment will start as an average uh, two weeks, two, three weeks after the surgery. And we have to see our patients. The appointment intervals will be every two weeks, taking advantage uh, of the wrap. And we know that the wrap effect uh, it takes three to four months. So that's why we want to see the patient at the intervals every uh, two weeks. As you can see in this patient that she has a mandibular advancement on a surgery first case uh, that we will see the change immediately. So the patient, we place the brackets one or two days before surgery. And when they come, come out of the surgery, they will see uh, the changes right away. So the cooperation and the motivation of our patient and their self steam uh, improves a lot. Let's see. This is the case that we just saw. This is her just eight days after the surgery. Of course, we will see all the swallow, but the changes on her face and the motivation that the patient will have will be much better. In the opposite side, in the conventional orthognatic surgical cases, um, like in a class three, sometimes it takes one or two years to decompensate the patients. And during the ortho treatment, the pre-surgical ortho treatment, we will make the patient to see worst. And this for their self-esteem is not good. So now with the surgery first approach, it changed. So the motivation and the acceptance for the procedure is much more easier. Again, I show the, the case I showed you at the beginning. On those case, class three cases, we have in a conventional surgical orthognatic case, we have to decompensate and it takes a long time before the surgery takes place. So one of the main advantage of the surgery first approach is reducing treatment time. Most of my cases that I've been doing with surgery first in, last, in the last four or five years, the treatment time uh, average it will, it, it, in all of the cases, is about 11 to 12 months. So I think this is a, a great advantage. Plus that we have the wrap. 
it has been uh, shown in the literature that we just with the cuts of the surgery, we will have the wrap, so the teeth will move uh, faster. So we have to take into consideration some factors for this approach. We really to know the know-how in the surgery first. The surgeon are the, and the orthodontist. We have to work out with an open mind surgeon and a good attitude. As I said before, it should be a very close communication between the orthodontist and the surgeon. Actually, we have to do two predictions. The, the first prediction is the way we want to see the patient right after the surgery. For example, in a class three case, I will need to see a, slide, a light class two right after the surgery. What, what will be the amount of overjet that we will need to see? It will depend on the amount of torque, torque that we want to do on the lower anteriors. But we will talk later about this. And also to do the prediction, how it's gonna look at the end of the treatment. We have to be aware of the occlusion right after the surgery. And probably this is one of the main concern of a lot of orthodontists when they do this type of uh, approaches. So, as I said, the surgeon and orthodontist must know what to do in the surgery first and it's to plan the orthodontic treatment according, according to the, decompen the decompensation that they, we will need it. So we have to be, with the communication, we have to be very accurate in the way we want to see the patient right after the surgery and the occlusion that it will be expected that that right after the surgery. In some cases, as, and that's why I don't want to do surgery first in class two with the short mandible with a, a deep curve speed, is because right after the surgery, we won't have any type of, of occlusion on the back. And this will be very difficult to handle and probably we will compromise the stability on, on those cases. As I said, we have to work with an open mind surgeon that will accept uh, what are our objectives. This is one of the surgeons I work with in Mexico City. Dr. Juan Jose Trujillo. He's a very conservative surgeon. I know, I know him since a long time. And the first time I talked to him <clears throat> that I wanted to do uh, this type of uh, approaches, the surgical, uh, surgery, surgery first approach. And because he's working in a, in a government hospital and they, they see a lot of patients. So I told him, eh, I won't charge the patient, the ortho, ortho treatment. I want to document and let's do uh, a good number uh, of cases. So when I asked him, he looked at me and he almost take me the temperature and he told me, are you crazy? You want me to do surgery first with you? He was just... Uh, <laughs> Aware of the, aware of the uh, uh, protocols of Sukhawa, and he didn't and like them at all. Like the Again, uh, when I talk with Larry Wolford about this, he's completely against uh, this type of, 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 of procedures. 
And that's why I said that we have to be working with some open mind doctors that they are open to learn and to see the cases. So when I show Dr. Trujillo uh, our protocol, uh, and because we are very good friends, he started doing it. And now he's even me sending me and recommend me patients to start uh, this type of uh, procedures. And as I said before uh, about the self-esteem of, of the patient, uh, I will recommend you to read this, this article about surgery first that talks about the level of satisfac satisfaction and the quality of life comparing with the conventional orthognathic uh, patients. So, always in a surgical case, we need a lot of communication between the orthodontist and the surgeon. But here, the communication has to be much more close. Um, the surgeon and the orthodontist, they really must know what do they know, what do they have to do on the treatment. This is the other surgeon I'm working with, Dr. Calleja. I know him since high school. We are very close friends. So that, why, that was very easy to convince him to start doing the, the, the ortho, uh, the, the surgery first approaches. He works in a private uh, hospital and <clears throat> It was much easier working with him, but the amount of patients that they receive is not the same amount of patients that they have in the, in the public hospital. That's why I wanted to work uh, with, with both. So this is what I think is very important in the surgery first approach. We have to be in the operating room and we have to check the occlusion right after the, the surgery. So this is the patient, they did the surgery, they put the rigid, the rigid fixation, they haven't placed the sutures and we have to check the occlusion that is the occlusion that we were planned either in the digital prediction with the digital surgical splints or with the model surgical made in the cast models. So I think this is a main situation that we have to check in our patients, in, in, in our surgery first patients. This is what is gonna be scary for a lot of orthodontics, the occlusion right after the surgery. So what we do, we uh, start the ortho treatment at the third week after the surgery, and we will see the patients every two weeks. We want to take advantage of the wrap. So this, this was, probably my fourth or fifth patient that I had at that time with the surgery first approach. And this is the occlusion that I see when he came to my office. So I was really scared because we are not used to see this type of occlusion right after the orthodontic treatment. So I said, what I'm gonna do with this type of occlusion. The, the patient, she had a class two, you, I, I, I show you the case, but taking advantage of the wrap, the light wires that I'm using right after the surgery and the intermaxillary elastics, then we will be able to correct, as you can see. So. Now, right after the surgery, who suggests the type and the force 
of the intermaxillary elastics is the orthodontist, not the surgeon. We, we will be seeing the patient right after the surgery. We will ind indicate what type of intermaxillary elastics we will be using because we have light wires, not heavy wires like in the conventional orthognatic uh, patients. So let's talk our, of, of our protocol that we are following. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about this protocol with one patient. We do the examination. Like in this case, it, it was funny because this case, uh, the patient was sent by the prosthetic uh, dentist because she broke the crown of one of her incisors, the upper central right incisor, the crown was broken. So in order that the prosthodontic dentist wanted to do his work, she recommend, he recommended her to do an ortho, ortho treatment. So she came with me and I saw that she had a mandibular retrusion she was in a class two relationship. She, she has some amount of, of crowding. Of course, this case could be treated just with orthodontics, but, but for me, ideally, was to do, it was a surgical case because of her mandibular, mandibular retrusion. So she accepted to do the orthodontic treatment before uh, the procedure with the prosthodontic uh, dentist. So what we do is a problem list to find out what is to make the diagnostic and the treatment planning at what are our main objectives of this treatment plan. So we have to do two types of, of predictions. One prediction is going to be what is going to be the occlusion, the, the occlusion looks going to be, be looking right after the surgery and how is the case going to be at the bonding. In this case, we use customized uh, brackets. Uh, this is the way the prediction to fabricate the customized brackets we, we use insignia in this case. So we tell the technician that this is gonna be a orthognatic uh, case and the class three, the class two or class three we will be sold by, uh, by surgery. The amount of torque is gonna be much calculated, much easier on class three patients uh, when we want to do the uh, positive uh, torque when we are using customized uh, brackets, but it's not a requirement. Then we do the cast or digital planning. We do the surgery in the cast or in the CBCT. At the beginning, we used to do it both. Now uh, in the private, practices, we do it uh, just with the CBCT, we do the digital prediction, and then we will fabricate, print the, the, the occlusal, the surgical splints. And at the public hospitals, we do it uh, the, 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 in the cast, and we will do the surgical uh, splints by the, by the normal methods as you can see it in this case, that she will have a mandibular advancement and a genuplasty of say seven millimeters of uh, advancement. And then we fabricate the digital surgical splint and then we print. So now with the digital uh, simulations, we, we can do a lot of things and predictions. Like in this case, 
uh, that he has a uh, tilt of the occlusal plane because uh, she had a big asymmetry. On the right uh, side, she had a short ramus compared to the other one. So she's gonna have a double surgery. Impaction of the maxilla more in the left side. And then the cuts on the mandible will be different. So now it's gonna be much easier to calculate it and evaluate with the surgical prediction. As I said before, probably one of the most, the most experienced orthodontists that is working with surgery first is Dr. Suhawara. But I don't like that much his approach. And Dr. Suhawara is a very close friend of Dr. Ravindrananda. And that's why he convinced Dr. Nanda and Dr. Uribe, Dr. Uribe, Flavio Uribe is from Colombia and he is the right hand or, or he used to be the right hand of Nanda. Now, Dr. Uribe is the chairman uh, of the ortho department in, in Farmington, Connecticut. And this is Dr. Villegas, another orthodontist and surgeon that works in Colombia. He's a very good uh, friend of mine. And probably I, I, I will say that Dr. Villegas is the one that is introducing the surgery first approach in, in Latin America. So I have the honor, a pleasure to be lecturing uh, with him. This is in Lebanon. The, where I met Dr. Nanda in one of the meetings in, in, in Lebanon. This is uh, another lecture that, I, that we gave in uh, Egypt about surgery first. This is Dr. Carlos Villegas and Dr. Juan Fernando Aristizal, Aristizabal. Both, both of them are from Colombia. So we are doing a different protocol than the protocol Suhawara uh, is doing. So we will explain that the protocol that we are doing it. So continuing talking about this protocol, we place the, the brackets one or two days before the surgery. And we send the, the patient without wires, no hooks. In this case, we have to play some turbos because the deep bite that the patient had, and we have to remove these turbo bites right before the surgery. Otherwise the surgical splints wouldn't uh, fit. But this is the way I like to send the patient to the surgery. We place uh, the hooks right before the surgery. We don't have to pl place the hooks in every bracket because I'm using daemon brackets. Uh, we know that we have a vertical slot and it's easier to, to place the hooks. So it takes me two, three minutes to place the hooks. You can place them before the surgery, but I don't want that the patient stays uncomfortable placing the brackets and the hooks. That's why most of the times I will try to do it just before the surgery. As you can see, the patient is already anesthetized on the general anesthesia. I place the hooks and then I remove the turbo bites. Then the surgery is made. We check the splints, either if it's a, a digital surgical splint or is a surgical splint or is a conventional surgical uh, splint. We check. As you can see, the patient doesn't have wires yet. They put the splint, they put the, the wires to, to fix the occlusion and to get ready for the 
rigid, rigid uh, fixation. I told at the beginning that for me, this is very important to check the occlusion right in this moment when the, when the surgeon already placed the surgical screws and, and the plates. If we are not agree with the occlusion that we were planned, I would rather ask the surgeon that we do it, take out the, the screws and the plates and do it everything again. So that's why the communication has been to be very straight. Sorry, I went. So right after we are convinced of the occlusion, then right after the surgery, we place the wires. Because of the amount of crowding, in a lot of times we are not able to place um, heavy wires. Most of the times we place a copper night tie or thermoactivated arch wires right after the, the surgery. And then I will see the patient after the surgery and we will recommend the type of intermaxillary elastics that we will be using. And at the end of the treatment, we will recommend the type of rotation. So in a class three, let's talk about our protocol of surgery phase, uh, surgery first in a class three patient. So we place the brackets one or two days before the surgery. We place the hooks. What is happening? I'm sorry, something went wrong. So we place the brackets one or two days before the surgery. We place the hooks in the operating room or if you want, you can do it the same day you place the brackets. Then the surgery is done. In a class three patient, we want to see a class two relationship, but not very bad, just a light class two with some uh, overjet. The amount of overjet will depend on the amount of torque we want to give to the lower anteriors. Sometimes, I place class three elastics right after the surgery to keep that overjet and then we will be able to do the positive torque in the lower anteriors. We place the wires <clears throat> in the operating room. We will wait for two or three weeks so until the patient can open the mouth and then we will start with the intermaxillary elastics. Depending on the case, we will send the type of elastics. I, I have to take care about my torque. I want to gain as soon as possible the amount of torque on the lower anteriors. That's in a class three relationship. We might be using also <clears throat> some time of a uh, box elastics. And we want to gain that <clears throat> torque. The more retrocline <clears throat> teeth we have in a class three, the more amount of the more amount of overjet I want to see right after the surgery. So I want to have that space to give the torque to my lower anteriors. <clears throat> and then we will continue leveling and align. And that's it. So let's see some cases. <clears throat> this case, today I wouldn't treat her with surgery first because it's a short uh, mandible and this is very hard 
to have the control after uh, the surgery. I might do it in early surgery. We will level and align <coughs> the, the, the lower arch and then do the surgery. But this case, we treated with surgery first. As you can see, the class two, the class two, and obviously because the short mandible, we have this type of uh, profile. She had some amount of crowding, upper and lower arch. She has a short mandible. <clears throat> and she has the presence of the third molars. So in the public uh, hospital, they rather to extract those third molars and wait six months to do the surgical procedures. In the private hospitals, they do the third molars right in the surgical procedures. They just play, put some plates. Uh, <clears throat> so it, 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 won't, it won't be so, it, because where the third molars are is where they make the cut. So that's why they have to put some, some, some plates. As you can see in the CVCT, the short mandible, we did the cast surgery and the surgical splint. It was planned to advance six millimeters, the, the mandible, and also to do a um, genioplasty to advance the chin. <coughs> as you can see it in the, in the cast. At the beginning, we used to do it both, the, the cast surgical procedure and also the prediction on the CVCT and do also the digital uh, surgical split. So this is the way we plan it. On the digital uh, CVCT, we plan to advance seven and a half uh, millimeters because the deep bite, we were planning to end up with a posterior open bite. And then a uh, genioplasty advanced the chin seven uh, millimeters to improve the, the profile of, of the patients. So here are the predictions on the CEF, uh, as, as you can see, and this is the prediction on the face of the patient. So this is the day we bond the brackets one day before the surgery. And this is the way we send the patient to the hospital. We place the brackets, upper and lower. And because she had a very deep bite, we put some turbo bites, otherwise she wouldn't be able to, to close. These turbo bites, we have to remove them in the operating room, otherwise the surgical splints wouldn't fit. We can see here the turbo bites that we place them in the, in the upper arch. <clears throat> and this is the way we send the patients with no wires and no hooks to the surgery. This is during the surgery when the patient is anesthetized, I start placing the hooks and removing the turbo bites. This is her after the surgery, and this is her occlusion. Eight days after the surgery, we place in the oper operating room 014 wires, upper and lower, copper nitride wires, and we start after the three weeks of uh, the surgery, we start with the intermaxillary elastics. This is uh, her right after the surgery. 
Hey Days. Doctor Nassif, excuse me, can you show the last again? This one? This one? No, the one before, the elastics, the total elastics. Okay. I think I'm moving backwards. Backwards. Here there. Here there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This, this is the type, in this, this case, the, the elastics we were planning to use because of the shift of the midline. That is what That's why we decided to use a class 3 on one side with a vertical vector. And in the other and side, the other which side, had a bigger had open bite, we decide to put class, to class two in the box the elastics. Box. Those the elastics, are very, box. Light. elastics are very light. They, they, are, they, two they are two ounces, ounces. 316, two, 316 ounces. two ounces. Because she has because very, she light has very light wires. And also, if we put heavy wires and we are using a asymmetrical intermaxillary elastics and because of the wrap it will be very easy to have a tilt of the occlusal plane mainly because the wrap and, and obviously uh, of the surgery that's why the, uh, these type of cases i don't treat them anymore with surgery first because the type of, of occlusion that we have right after the surgery so let's continue seeing the, the, this case. This is after eight days. We just saw her to evaluate. She couldn't open wide. So I'm not changing wire. Sometimes I recommend to use some intermaxillary elastics. This is six weeks after the surgery. Now we can start seeing the improvement of the occlusion more in the right side, the improvement of the midline. Remember that we use class three on this side. Now the midline is going to that, to that way. Look the way she was at the beginning. Because I was, this was not the really bite. She was very swell. And when we took the photos and we used the retractors she was not completely biting because they the swallowing and she couldn't bite the way she, she, she was. But still, we have a, 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 an occlusion that we are not used to seeing right after the surgical procedure. This is her four months after the surgery. You can see the, the occlusion is improving. On the, on the right side, on the left side, we still to work more on it. So we took the CVCTs. Usually on those type of patients, when we do the mandibular advancement, uh, the airway uh, improves. Unfortunately, the patient has to move to United States. Their parents were, used to work in the American Embassy in, in Mexico. She was from United States, so they, they have to move back to United States. But this is the way when the doctor in United States received her, this is at seven months of treatment, you can see the occlusion the way it is it's much uh, better. We have to work more in arch development to continue using a little bit more of a class two elastics, but you can see now that she's now in, in without the swallow and the occlusion is getting better. So that's why I recommend more the surgery first approach for class three patients which is going to be much easier to manage uh, the surgery first approach. So let's see one case step by step in a class three patient. In this case, she, she was recommended by the surgeon. And this girl, 
she had a neighbor that has a class three and this patient recommend her to go to the hospital, this public hospital to do the, the surgery. And from the hospital, they, they send it to me. So let's see the case step by step, what uh, we did. It's not a very severe class three. She has some uh, asymmetry. Her uh, uh, corp of the mandible is a little bit longer on the left than in the right side. The class three is more due to the mandible than the maxilla. So th these are the complete records because we can see the asymmetry the chin more to the, to the right side, very slightly. This is the occlusion that, uh, that she has. She has a class, full class three. Can we treat her just with orthodontics? Yes, of, uh, of course. But in patients, in uh, females that they have a class three, I would rather treat them with uh, surgery. Plus, these patients, these patients came and very recommended for the uh, surgery. So she, we didn't want, we didn't need to convince her to do the the orthodontic treatment, treatment uh, the, uh, the ortho, orthodontic uh, treatment. There are some patients that they come with us. We suggest the, the surgery, but they're either afraid, afraid or they cannot uh, afford, and we have to do it and compensate the case just with orthotics. Anyhow, we did, we treat this case with the surgery first approach. Uh, she didn't have that amount of, of crowding. She had already had uh, pulled out the third molars. And as I said, with the diagnosis, we find that the class three was due more than for the pro was more for the mandible than the maxilla. We took the CBCT, we did the predictions, we did some predictions doing a maxillary advancement. This prediction is with a, a mandibular a setback. <clears throat> So let's see the case step by step, what type of uh, arch wires uh, we were uh, using on her. So we place Damon Q brackets from second molar to second molar, one day before of the surgery. These are the torques that we choose. We choose low torque on the upper four anteriors high torque on the cuspids and standard torque in the lower anteriors. Um, as you see in the lateral, the retroclination of the lower anteriors wasn't that bad. So we didn't want to have that much of a overjet. So we asked the surgeon to leave this patient in a very light class two, just to give a very little of positive torque on the lower anteriors. Also on here, we place the hooks with the brackets one day before the surgery. So this is the way we send the patient for the hospital one day before. So they did a, the surgery on the mandible. They place the surgical splint to do the fix it, uh, the rigid fixation. Then they took out the splint and we check the occlusion. So this is the amount of overjet that we were planning to leave right after the surgery. And now we are checking the occlusion on her and before they put the sutures and if everything is okay, they, they put the sutures and then I proceed to place the wires. So now we are placing the wires 
In this case, you will see the type of wires that we put. We put round wires because of the, even though she didn't have that amount of uh, crowding, I cannot put the uh, rectangular wires. So we place a uh, round wires, upper and lower, because here has a lot of more discrepancy uh, on the leveling and a line. We have to use an 014 uh, round wire, and I think in the opera it was an 018. <clears throat> so this is the way. So you will see in this uh, diagram the dark numbers in the upper are the months and in the light numbers are the days. <clears throat> so we start on the zero with the surgery. We put the brackets one day before of uh, the surgery. In the operating room, we place an 018 copper night tie, upper arch, and 04 copper night tie in the lower arch. This is her eight days after the surgery. We can even see the sutures with the 018 upper 014 in the lower. This is the type of occlusion that we are seeing right after the surgery. And this is the amount of overjet that we were planning to have. At the beginning, I'm not going to be using class two elastics. The opposite, I might be using very light class three elastics to keep the overjet. And as long as I am increasing the size of the wires, I will be having the positive torque in the lower anteriors. This is the swallowing that she had eight days after the surgery. This is the way she was before the surgery. And this is the occlusion that we have eight days after the surgical procedure. This is 15 days. As I told you, uh, our protocol is to see our patients every 15 days to take advantage of the wrap. So we left the upper and lower arch wires one month and then we start using some W elastics, again very light elastics to start settle down the occlusion. This is uh, 15 days after the surgery we start with that type of elastics as you can see it here you can see the the force that we were using it three and a half ounces and we continue with the same arch wires this is her 15 days after the surgery then we move on to a 16 by 25 copper night tie in the upper arch and a 14 by 25 copper night tie in the lower arch. This is her occlusion five weeks after the surgery. This is her profile. Then because we start seeing some uh, spaces, we put a uh, a CK change in the lower and upper arch. And now we have a 18 by 25 copper night tie, upper and lower arch. We are in the third month after the surgery. This is her 10 weeks after the surgery. As you can see, we made some bends because she was she had some interference in the upper and lower segments that's why i made made those uh, bends to intrude a little and avoid this type of interferences we check for the smile arc 
Then we move on to a 19 by 24, five TMA in the upper arch and a 19 by 25 TMA in the lower arch. And we are in the four and a half month after the treatment. And she's done, almost done. No crowding. This is three months after the surgery, the way she looks. And this is when we debond her. So the treatment time for here was four months and a half. And this is the occlusion that we gain uh, after we debond with the fixed uh, uh, retainers, upper and lower. This is her panoramic when we debond her. And you can see the inclination of the lower uh, anterior, the incisor. It wasn't that bad. So it was very little the amount of positive torque that we need to place on her. So this is her four and a half months. One of the, our main objectives of this type of treatments is reducing treatment times. So as I said, taking advantage of the wrap that we are not using that we are avoiding the pre-surgical orthodontic uh, phase. And this is her profile, right and left side when we debond. And the occlusion before and after. In as an average time, five months, five, less than a five months of treatment time. Let me finish the topic with one case that we are doing it surgery first with Invisalign. This is under, under treatment. She just had the surgical procedure this uh, January. Uh, she had two orthodontic uh, treatments She's not happy with, with her face. Uh, in the past, other orthodontists were, uh, had recommend her to do the surgery. She didn't want to, she was afraid. She had the two orthodontic treatments, but she's not happy with her face and she's not willing to do another ortho treatment with braces and then she find out about the surgery first approach and she find out about the Invisalign system. So we are treating her now with this type of appliances. In this case, uh, the planning was to advance the maxilla to improve her profile. She already had extractions of four by cuspids, we cannot do a lot of uh, decompensation on her. Here are the digital scanning. So we do all the diagnosis with the CVCTs, as you will see. We did the prediction with the uh, Invisalign in order to have the, the fixation and to use the intermaxillary elastics, we plan to put four mini implants in the upper arch and four mini implants in the lower arch, as you will see it uh, now. This is the prediction with the mandibular setback and the with ma maxillary advancement and the genioplasty. So now uh, our Diagnosis, it has been modified with my two friends uh, and me, Dr. Enrique, Dr. Gonzalez, Enrique Gonzalez, 
and Dr. And Solorio, Solorio, we are doing this, are doing this uh, that we call it best philosophy, best philosophy that, that mainly consists, mainly consists or we design it a method of diagnosis uh, to the, in a defined order which allow us selecting an individualized uh, mechanics for each case. So what we do, it's we do a general, general display of CBCT, uh, watching it coronal, sagittal, and axial. We evaluate the airway of the patient, the TMJ, the teeth and surrounding bone and cortical structures. And we do an interactive uh, analysis. Uh, I'm gonna just give a very little review what we do before we are planning the talk. We superimpose the CVCT on this type of program. We evaluate the, the TMJ and also we can, that this program can help us to choose the right uh, torques and evaluate the, the, the cortical bone. So that is gonna help us or it's helping us a lot mainly in evaluating the amount of torque that we are planning to have in each of uh, our patients. It's funny because today we are lecturing, we are doing a, a webinar in different times. Dr. Solorio just finished giving a lecture in Argentina. Dr. Enrique, which is here now hearing us, will give a, le a lecture, a webinar in Honduras. And now I'm speaking to you in Palestine, which is a big honor to me. So let's continue with the, with the same case. We evaluate the, the airways with this uh, type of uh, diagnosis that we are doing and using this type of program. Evaluate the TMJ uh, before, uh, and before we start placing the brackets, sometimes you have to find the discrepancies between CO and CR and uh, do a better diagnosis in our treatments. So this is the case of her, the way we diagnose the orthognatic uh, procedure with the surgery first approach. Um, her condals were okay, even though the shape is not the one that we were expecting. So this is the evaluation. Unfortunately, we don't have that amount of time. This is, those are the predictions that we did on her uh, and the surgery on the cast and also the digital uh, planning for the surgery. So this is her. We place the mini implants two days before the surgery. We have uh, already uh, ready the, the aligners, and this is the way we send her for the surgery. This is during the surgery where the maxilla is completely loose, and that's why they are going to be using the mini implants to do the, the to place the surgical splint, as you are seeing in the video. And then after they do the fixation, as you can see it here, oops, the video is not running. Okay, anyway. So these are, those are the changes uh, right away. And also, we can be using our intermaxillary elastics, light ones that they can be using from the mini implants or even from the aligners. So she's, she's on, on, on treatment now. So I'm, I'm finishing. If you have any, any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasib, for a very nice lecture, a very nice way of treatment. 
Uh, we have uh, some uh, questions from the attendees. I will read them for you. Um, the first one, uh, is there any reason why you don't place the hooks while bonding, but just before the operation? 